lions and tigers and Daniel. Oh my. Today we investigate the story of Daniel in the lion's den. You might have heard this as a kid's story growing up, but it is anything but. And we have here in Daniel chapter 6 this incredible story of God's intervention in the life of one of his one of his children that trusted in him. So as we dive into this story, let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this, this story about how we can trust in you. Thank you for your, your promises that we get through this book and may we see our own lives clearer we love you and we thank you in Jesus' incredible name. Amen. And this is the story. We begin after this transition from the kingdom of Babylon into a new kingdom, the next kingdom. And it begins like this. Daniel chapter 6. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. Then, then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to set him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these governors and satraps thronged uh, thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Now, verse 10, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his window open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased within himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, And the king sealed it with his own signet ring 
and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Let's pause for a second here. One, what are you thinking about these, these uh, governors and satraps here? Ooh, smarmy people, aren't they? They go to the king and say, oh, we all are in agreement. Let's, let's make this very flattering uh, law that, and, and, and of course the king is like, oh, what? I'm flat. That's what. So oh, great. Sure. What, get won some brownie points. Uh, signed it and made it law, which a law that cannot change. And then they come back and they say, oh, you know that. Uh, it, didn't you just sign a law? He's like, yeah, I did. And well, it can't be changed. What about it? And said, well, Daniel, Daniel, he's he's this Daniel. He violated it. And the king immediately sees his regret. And after he's trying to figure out what's going on, then they come back to him. <laughs> the audacity. And they, and he, they said, um, and they approached the king and said, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians, that no decree or statute that the king established can be changed, not even by the king. How dare they tell the king what the law says? I mean, what is, what is this situation? So he knows he's been duped. He's, he's pretty... He's, he's had it with them, but he has to keep going with this decree. And it's fascinating. His words to then Daniel, he says, your God, whom you serve continually. He knows Daniel. He's seen him. He's recognized him. He called him out from among the, uh, Daniel's perceived equals at that time. And he calls him out. And he's even thinking about making him first, uh, I mean, right under the king in his kingdom. And he has a relationship with Daniel. He recognizes his work ethic. He also knows stuff about his personal life. And he says, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. The confidence that Darius has in Daniel's God. And we can contrast Darius with uh, Belshazzar, or we can contrast him with Nebuchadnezzar and see how Nebuchadnezzar, he said, oh, the, the king of, of the Jews, or, uh, I mean, the, um, the God of the Jews, or recognizing, you know, Daniel's God. Uh, but here, Darius, he, he just has faith in, in Daniel's God, but he says, um, in God, Daniel's God's ability to rescue him. Uh, there's, there's, some, there's an extra bit of faith here that wasn't experienced by the other kings until, of course, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's um, tree, after his tree vision. There's, there's also an interesting parallel here. Have you noticed some of the, does this story kind of feel familiar? It, maybe, yeah, because you've heard the story before, but there's certain details here that are, are paralleling, that are, that are foreshadowing or echoing uh, another story that you might be very familiar with and it, the essence is there, but you can't put your finger on it. There is this man who is innocent. He, there is a plot against him. There is a law that is condemning, uh, and, this, and he's condemned to death. And then when he's put into this, this, uh, this, this hole, this uh, cave, so to speak, a stone is then rolled in front of it, and it's sealed. Um, does that sound familiar? Whew. There is a beautiful parallel, and I preached on this before. Uh, and many other people have, have noticed this, and there's whole Bible studies on it. But there's incredible parallels between the story of Daniel and, the, and what happened with Jesus. And I think, it's, I think there's poetry in real life, and especially when God is, is moving in story, that we're able to see certain threads. And this is just a side comment. But if you find... If you, as you review your life, ask God, show me the threads that I can follow in my life, that I can trace your hand moving. And maybe you'll see a similarity between you and Daniel or, or you and, and Jesus's life or, or you and one of the other people in the Bible and these stories that we are recorded for us, that we can look in these stories and see our, our own and also gain strength in knowing that God worked for them then. And he will work for us now. Um, Jesus was, uh, Daniel in this sense was a type of Christ. 
uh, that he goes down innocently into the pit. And then he is, well, I won't, I won't spoil that. Let's keep reading. Daniel chapter 6, verses, verse 18 and on. Now, the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also, his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that he should take Daniel, they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatsoever was found on him because he believed in his God. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them, them into the den of lions, them, their children and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote to all peoples, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who he delivered Daniel from the power of the lions who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And this completes the, the story half of Daniel. Isn't that a neat story? And I love how Darius' decree has certain elements reminiscent of the decrees, the various decrees that Nebuchadnezzar had put out. And Darius, in a way, has come to that same spot that Nebuchadnezzar had, recognizing who God was and that he, that he was the God that had a kingdom that would never end. And for a, a reigning monarch to be able to make that uh, declaration about uh, uh, someone else, that, that says a lot. Isn't that neat? I love this story. This is great. Uh, there is... I, I want to ask a few questions here. Um, but first, I want to handle something that is difficult. Uh, in this story, right at the end, it, it talks about how the king then turns and sends those, those accusers in, which, you know, we think, okay, well, justice for those that were, that conspired to, to, to destroy an innocent person. Um, and, we see that kind of uh, justice here. But then he throws in their children and their wives. I think in the Bible, when we read the Bible, we have to pull, we have to understand the context there. And just because it's there, it doesn't justify it. And I think that that hermeneutic, that way of looking at scripture is damaging to people's faith. I think we need to understand that just because something is, is there doesn't, condone it, uh, but it describes what happened. And in that context, uh, families, it was a collective perspective on, on individual. An individual doesn't exist by themselves. They're a part of the family unit. And so in this culture, in this context, they all, all paid the price for the, the father or the husband's um, decisions involved in the, in this, uh, in this conspiracy. And we have in scripture though, in, uh, in scripture, it says that God decreed that the children should not pay the price for their parents' sin. 
and that there should be a delineation between a difference, a recognized difference between uh, one person's actions and the, and the consequence continuing on to their children, that there is already a natural consequence um, that we can see in, in our own experiences. Uh, people in our lives m have made their own decisions for themselves, and we end up suffering for their consequent, uh, for their actions. Um, we need to recognize that even though we aren't in this kind of context anymore, that the, the things that we do, the things that we decide affect us, but they also affect the, the people that we love, our, our spouse, uh, uh, and will affect our children and possibly for generations to come. The way that we view ourselves, even just as innocuous as that, to, to say our, our own body image, for instance, uh, that can be passed on for generations of people feeling, learning that's the way that I should view myself and then passing that on. Um, it, it, it feels very... Uh, innocent or, or some form of, of twisted humility, but, but it has lasting consequences. Um, and then, or, or the way that we teach children to get ahead, because that's the way we had to get ahead, was by, by putting other people down, that will continue also. And it will destroy parts of that person's ability to live completely, uh, fully individually. And Th those are hard things. Those are very hard things. And this is one, one of those situations in scripture where we need to recognize that this was what King Darius did and that God had already mandated something very different for his people. That, um, and in fact, it was used in a, a, a condemnation of a particular mindset that Israel got to at one point where they said, the, the fathers ate sour grapes and the children's teeth were set on edge. So there is this, they, they were making that a proverb and God was like, that's not, that's not my, uh, that's not my way. So there's, there, there's a lot to consider when, when looking at this, but I wanted to point that out because it's important. I want to ask you, review your life. And, and if you're, if you see your, L, your life in a, in a Daniel sense, or, or try to see him, see yourself in Daniel's shoes, sandals, what are the predators that lurk around you? I think that, well, one, we, in the coming chapters, in chapter seven and eight, uh, next Sabbath, we'll be looking at the, the pre like, figurative predators, uh, these, these beasts of prey that, that are, are representing various entities. And we'll get into that. Um, and it, it's very important and beautiful. The, the, con the conclusion of that, of those visions, but what are the predators that lurk around you? They might be individuals. They might be actual people that have targeted you, that are persecuting you, uh, that are pursuing you for your destruction, much as the, the governors and satraps were for Daniel. Um, they also might be organizations or uh, just uh, elements of society or elements in your life uh, that are intangible. Like I mentioned before, a certain type of self-image or a certain kind of pressure that's on you continually. Uh, maybe perfectionism is a predator that's around you. Uh, maybe there's uh, some sort of self-worth concept that is, is, is pulling. Uh, you, you know your situation. And if you don't, you can ask God, what it, search my heart, know my ways, see if there's any, any way like this in me. And God will bring that to your memory. To your um, understanding and then process that out with somebody else that also uh, is acknowledges God and, and trusts his guidance. What are the predators that lurk around you? It's interesting in this story you've got the governors and satraps and you also got the lions and God is effectively able to silence both. Um, and and I think the question then that comes from that is after you've considered your predators, who are you? Uh, Darius looked at Daniel and said, this is Daniel's God is able to keep him. Uh, 
And is God your God? Uh, is it wasn't just a, a uh, some sort of allegiance thing. There wasn't like he just he was in da- God's club. This was Daniel who serves him continually. That Daniel's heart was for God. His identity was was in relationship to this God, and Darius knew it just by in relationship to him. He uh, and and the 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 enemies of Daniel knew it just by the way that he lived his life. And they saw that he had an excellent spirit in him. Do you trust God in these situations? I think, I think that some people might look at this story and feel that the lesson, the moral of this story is that we should not be ashamed to pray. Um, are, are, are you embarrassed of praying in public? You know, if, that, if that's the moral, if that's the conclusion of this story, then I feel like it's really... Uh, it's, that's a high pressure, uh, low yield kind of, uh, moral to be pulling from this incredible story of what, what happened between Darius, God and Daniel. Um, I think when looking at, it's a very superficial, it doesn't take in all the facts here. Daniel is praying three times a day. It says when he heard verse 10, when he heard that the decree had been signed. So Daniel was fully aware of what the decree was. He was fully aware of what the consequences were. But he went up to his house and he faced that window and he prayed three times that day, as was his custom. And that last phrase, as was his custom, is essential. In scripture, it there is no right way to pray, okay? Uh, there are stories of people praying in public. There are stories of people praying very, very privately uh, or without even uttering words. Uh, there are just just in their mind, they're praying. There are stories of people praying uh, like this, uh, outside on a rooftop or on a balcony. And then there's stories of people praying uh, in, in quiet and in secret. And, uh, and in fact, uh, Jesus said, right, don't be like the publican that's praying in the public square and gets the praise of all the people that walk by and say, well, how pious is that person? Um, instead, pray like, uh, like the publican that couldn't even look. Oh, anyway, I mix those up. Pray like the one that that prays in humility, recognizing who uh, that they they don't deserve God's attention, but they still pray because they know that God is hearing. God listens and he cares. What is your custom? What is your custom? It's not about I will not adjust my life (laughs) habits to accommodate the needs of other people. Because we see in Daniel that he and his friends from chapter one adjusted all kinds of of habits and customs and uh, where they were feeling comfortable and what they were used to in order to accommodate the needs of their particular position that they were in. But they would not yield in the in the in those crucial areas that when it came to their loyalty to God and. And yet they did it in, a, in kind ways. They asked of the chief of the eunuchs. They, uh, they, they carried themselves in a way that was respectful, that was honorable, that was admirable. And Daniel was no different here. What is your custom uh, of, of praying, of spending time with God? Um, and I, I don't think... I don't think that variance is the problem. I think it's it's giving that up or changing it because of pressure. And anyone or anything that forces is false. The last resort of every false religion is force. 
and it might be some dominating law that's put out there, uh, like in this story, or it might be a particular religion that it has has some sort of uh, forcible sway on on people, uh, and it might even be something within Christianity or Adventism that is forceful in its implementation. It's coercing the soul uh, of the, uh, it was coercing the conscience. And th that is, it's false. It indicates that whatever is behind that is false. Maybe that's been your experience. You grew up where, where you were forced to go to church by your parents. Um, maybe you were forced in, in whatever context you were in to, to have some sort of outward show of, of piety, but inside it just was completely inauthentic. It wasn't just that you were being led to experience things outside of your awareness or comfort zone. This was force. This was punitive. This was, uh, uh that's, that's beast power. That's, that is, those are the lions, but that, that custom of Daniel could discern his relationship with God and his habits in relationship to his God were, he was able to discern what was, what he needed to accust, be, uh, to make accommodation for and what he needed to continue. And it was very clear that he saw that this was a force that he should not yield to and that he should be in relationship with his God. Um, because this had to do with his, his own personal prayer time. And now, when I ask, what is your custom? And you think about, uh, well, I don't want to change what I do. What, what is your custom? Do you have a custom? Maybe you're, you're hearing this and you're going, I don't really know what my custom is. I don't know what, uh, you know, I, I, I go to church. Well, Hey, you know, we're, we're in church right now, but we've had to adjust, right? We've had to make accommodation, but we're still meeting together. We're still connecting with each other through, through every, every means possible. So it's not about change. It's about our connection to God. And it's about the way that we, that we express our loyalty to him. Not just demonstrate. See, what is it? It's not just about demonstrating my loyalty to God. It's not just about having... Uh, the T-shirt that says, uh, you know, Jesus is my is my Lord. Um, it doesn't just mean about the the license plate that says the seventh day is the Sabbath. You know, like some people have. It, it it it's also about the relationship between you and your Creator, your God that you serve continually. Um, it's not just about the doing, but it's about the relationship. It's about the identity that you have with God. And to, to understand that it's not something I can just tell you, well, this is what it is, because then it would just be uh, asking you to conform. Um, I want to encourage you that in the group, that you, the, the small group, the discussion group, the Sabbath school that you are a part of, um, with those people that you have spiritual connection with, talk about what is your custom or what, ask them what is their custom in relationship to God? How, what do, how do they spend their time with God on a regular basis? Um, what are the, the special dates or the special times that they've reserved and made holy? Um, I remember uh, one of my professors uh, at seminary, he said that he's found that a lot of people get nervous around the Sabbath issue. And, and if people say, Hey, do you want to go catch a ball game uh, this Saturday? And, and they, they get very nervous and they say, I, 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 you know, I, I mean, I have, I have church stuff and I, and they, they, they hem and haw about that. Uh, but then he found that the clearest way to com communicate that is, you know, I would love to, but I, I have a, a date with God every, every Saturday um, from Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown. And I spend that time with him and, and in resting from all, all other kinds of things. But I would love to spend time with you at another time. And I love that way of communicating 
while still maintaining his priority and uh, recognizing, even in a, in a very open way, his relationship to God, he was still was very accommodating and inviting of that person's uh, desire to spend time with him. And I think that, that that's a, in many ways like that, we can hear the way people talk about their relationship with God, recognize where what our habits are, but also maybe things that we would like to change for the better, for the positive, to be in closer relationship with God, to, to serve him continually in a, in a beautiful way that is, is resembled by Daniel, but also by Darius. If you look at your own devotional life, your own time that you spend with God, and you need um, a, to revamp it, uh, to recommit yourself to some sort of special time. And, and honestly, I'm, I'm preaching to myself right now too. Would you pray with me? I I would like to see myself have a relationship with God that persists against the predators that that might surround me or even come from within me. And I know that the God that we serve, that we worship, is able to shut their mouths <laughs> and is able to make us stand, even when we're down in the dark of a den, um, sealed, uh, our fate is sealed, God is able to, to save us. And uh, this is the God that we pray to, and this is the God that I'm inviting you to renew your relationship with again today. Will you pray with me? God of, of amazing things, the God of people, of real people with real experiences, we ask that you continually remind us that your kingdom doesn't end and that you you are the God that we serve. I think sometimes we confuse the force or the pressure that we feel, or whether it's imposed by somebody else or self-imposed, <clears throat> with you in your way. And we confuse that. Lord, I ask that you shut those lions' mouths, that you silence the oppressors that are in our lives. You know how to turn a plot. You, you know how to, to bring that resurrection conclusion. And you are the God of that kind of kingdom that doesn't end. Lord, in, in every, um, challenge that we face, we ask that uh, we, we, we turn to you and may my friends and myself uh, cling to your promises, not just in those times of, of persecution, but also in times of, uh, of every day of waking up and turning to you and spending time with you to begin our day, quality time throughout the day to, to stop and, and set aside time to recenter ourselves on you, keeping our mind fixed on you, and, and then completing our days as we go, as we slip into, into sleep, that we, we do that talking to you instead of rehearsing our problems and concerns and worries, we, we talk about how glorious you are and how mighty and strong and able to save is our God. Thank you for these promises. Thank you for these stories. And thank you for the prophecies that are coming. The prophecies that promise a future 
where justice, equality, and love prevail. This is your kingdom, and we are your servants, and we thank you. In the name of Daniel's God, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. My friend, remember, trust God, and love each other. Thank you for exploring this adventurous book with me.